right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Any questions before I get going? Questions? The homework was too easy. Uh, yes, go ahead. So, oh, hold on. Homework five B. Let me first of all see what it is. Um, hang on. You guys remember this thing more than I do. Huh. Hello? Hello? Okay, here's homework five. Homework five B. Yes, okay. Let's look what it does. So, um, are we just supposed to add, add to that? That sounds right, yes. So, so you're supposed to, it gives you the viewer, um, because that's just a boring class. Um, it doesn't give you the component because it wants you to make two flags. So you need to do that. And yes, then, um, apparently I was, nice in the flag itself that I gave you a bunch of code already and then I said you know just just fill in the various things in here and um, I guess I've given away a, a part of the answer right Some, I mean you still have to figure out the dimensions um, I think I've given you more than I meant to Um, yeah, I think I, I didn't, uh, I actually meant you to figure these ones out, so I may retra retract, I may modify that one. Now your classmates will hate you for having asked. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but you could always watch the video and find it there, I guess. All right, so yeah, my intention was now looking at it to, to, to not give you these coordinates but then, <clears throat> no, I mean, they were in the book, right? This is, this is code that's straight from the book. So I take it back. I, I'm not giving away anything. So um, yeah, just fill that thing up. <clears throat> so I will often do that. In particular, I will do this in the exam, that I kind of give you the outline, and then, I, then you just have to fill in the dots. Because in the exam, obviously, you wouldn't have the time to type out a whole class like that or even to copy and paste it. So <clears throat> that, that should constrain the space somewhat. Other questions? I just want to make sure that you understand that with these graphical programs, NetBrad really can't do very much for you. It's going to compile and run the class. It's going to take a screen snapshot and it's going to paste that into the report. And so when the grader runs it, uh, it does the same thing. And the grader just sees what your program looked like. If you draw two frogs instead of two flags, NetBrad won't know the difference. Uh, hopefully, the grader will be alert enough to notice that and then complain. Any other questions on the homework? Yes? Say again. Well, the flag is the single object. And a flag, you could say it contains three rectangles. You could actually make the implementation differently and put the three rectangles as instance variables. Oh, now, you, now your question is, you want to move those rectangles. Mm. No, there's no, no particular way of gluing them together. You have to do it. Okay. Yeah, there's <coughs> the, the, the graphics library is not particularly fancy or anything. It just has these very primitive constructions. Um, now, in this particular instance, what you could do is 
So it's always tedious to draw something with that x left y top offset because it, it appears like everywhere in your code. What you could do is you could first construct them at 0, 0, and then you could call translate on all of them. There's only four of them, right? The three little ones and the outline. So that would be a viable strategy that would make your code a little bit simpler. I didn't really cover that uh, all that much because translate, unfortunately, only works for rectangles. It would be nice if you could translate ellipses as well. There's no rational reason why you shouldn't be able to. It's just not a part of the library. Other questions? All right. Let's see. If um, there were a few questions on what to expect in part A you know, what it should actually look like. And I, I guess it's a little late for, for the draft. Um, in the draft, you saw, you know, a line and then a tiny tri triangle. In part, uh, for the final, you should expect to see a pentagon that looks like this. So that's, the, that's what the bug actually traces out. When you look at the code, you see it makes turns of, sev of 70, two degrees, five times, and that's what makes the, uh, the pentagon. And it, it happens to be oriented like this. So if you see something different, then you have something wrong. Yes? In final, I noticed that the code uh, doesn't have a negative. So it's uh, rotated. The code? Yeah, the code doesn't have. Can you go to the final? Or the pentagon? It doesn't have. Um, I think that's correct. And the, re the reason here is that for the final, I said, you should take into account that the y-axis goes, goes a different way. So this is a general problem when, you, when your problem space is regular old coordinates. So if you have something that you envision living on the xy plane, on the Cartesian plane, then the y-axis goes upwards. But on the graphics coordinate systems, it's always that the y-axis goes downwards. So, and um, so, so on the Cartesian plane, you have 0, 0, you know, somewhere in the middle, and then y goes upwards. And the graphics one is you have 0, 0 on top. You don't have any negative pixels. And then the y coordinate goes downwards. And every time that you have this translation between the two, you have to account for that. And so in, in our example here, that's where the, where the minus here comes in. That's the, what flips the y axis. And yes, you should then see the pentagon flipped the other way around. And so it's, the way we've interpreted the bug in the past was that the bug lives in the Cartesian plane. And so now I wanted you to draw it so that it matches with that interpretation. But it is a, it is a perennial mess. And one really wishes that the people who first designed these graphics coordinates could have uh, made it the same way that the mathematicians have done it for hundreds of years but maybe they didn't know any mathematics. Um, can we just make our own? What? You could make your own graphics class. Um, and in a previous edition of this book, I had a version of the graphics class that was beautiful. It had 0, 0, right smack in the middle. Y coordinates went up uh, the, the way that every student would expect it. The instructors hated it because they said, well, that's not standard Java. Now the poor students have to learn standard Java and Horstman's graphics class. Never mind that the thing took about two minutes uh, for every student to learn. It was the instructors where it must have taken hours and they objected to it. So I had to take it up. Um, anyway, it is something that occurs all the time. So it's a good thing to, to uh, uh, it's a good issue to uh, be alerted about. Um, <clears throat> so let's make sure that you don't forget that, uh, that mi little minus there. The grader is uh, instructed to stare at, your, at the Pentagon. And if, if it's the wrong way, you're going to lose some points on it. Yes? I, I noticed that when, um, when you look at the graph, it has uh, six line segments. Yes. One for the single line. Yes. Five, five yes. And then when you look at the final, you only see five. Yes, and there's a reason for that. Um, and that is that in the draft, if I <coughs> no, in the draft, I first moved um, 
to 100, 100. And if I had not done that, then the Pentagon would have been even more unrecognizable because then it would have hovered up here in tiny pixels, most of which would have been cut off. And I thought that was, would raise so many questions that I, would, that I was better off having the bug travel and then make its tiny movement here. And the final version, I did not do that because that would have been entirely counterproductive. The whole point of the final version was to move the origin somewhere in the middle of the display. Other questions? Yes. I'm sorry? I see. So <clears throat> generally, there is three levels of classes. There's the viewer, which is totally routine. It just shows the component. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, there are the classes for the thing or things of which you want to uh, display one or more. That might be a flag, a car, a house, a dog, that kind of thing. And the component is the one that's responsible for showing one or more of those. It would construct a house and show it. It would construct two flags and show it. What's that? Well, it depends on, uh, it, I would say no, because a tester has a very specific role. A tester is there to uh, test a class, get some outputs, and, make, and compare those against the expected values. The component doesn't do the latter part. The component has no way of comparing. It just brings it out there for the human eye to see. Other questions? Yes. I see. Um, OK, <clears throat> that's a good question. So from the point of view of the flag, any three colors should work. So let's look at the the flag class here. Oops, that's the wrong one. So it's, it's a little hard to see because I'm not, uh, it, it's been cut off here. Um, it takes three colors in the constructor. Uh, oh, I know where you can see that. You can see that in the draft. Um, can you? No, you can't see that in the draft. <laughs> um, it just says that, so in the constructor for the, for the uh, vertical flag, you pass any three colors. And the, the vertical flag will then draw itself with the three colors that were passed in, in the constructor. Now, one could conceivably write a program that puts this vertical flag to use, that prompts the user for three colors in some way. But you don't have to do that. Instead, what you do in the component class, you make two specific flag objects. and in those constructors, you specify the color. I guess since the, f the draft deadline is over, I can just quickly do this here. So I, oh, this is the one where the actual flag was hidden. So should I do it in here or should I type it up in NetBeans first? I'm going to do it in, no, not NetBeans, in, in BlueJ first because it's so tedious to compose anything here. So give me a minute and I'll start BlueJ. This is home of 5B. And so this is vertical flag component. So now, unfortunately, I'm getting an, uh, a complete blank here. Uh, I don't want to write this thing from scratch. So from somewhere, I have to find myself a, uh, some other component class. So let me just find one real quick. Um, car. 
Okay, here's one. And I prefer doing uh, the copy and paste so that I don't have to worry about misspelling any of the stuff. Um, all right, so now I don't want to have cars, but I want flags. So let's just make one. Flag one equals new flag. What do I specify? Um, help me out here. What do I specify? The top left corner, the su some size, and then three colors, right? So. So I'm sure I need to import color. And then I draw it. So this one, yeah, I can't test in BlueJet because I don't actually have the code for the flag yet. Um, it was vertical, vertical colored flag. No, no, it's the flag itself. Vertical. I think it's vertical flag. So let's try this here. Oh, I didn't give it the right name. That's the drawback of copy paste. No, no, I'm, I'm doing it in the wrong place. Um, here. Okay, so now it draws it apparently at position 100, 100, and with width 100. And so <coughs> to answer your question now is that the way that the user specifies the colors is by constructing them in this way. So you can now make as many flags as you like in as many places as you like with these colors. Um, so the colors that I chose here are the colors of the Horseman family crest. Um, and you would now instead choose the, this for uh, whatever it is, uh, Belgium and France. I, I forgot what <coughs> colors you want. Does that answer your question? Yeah. No, no, they should be, you should uh, pick up the colors for those two countries that are specified. So just look up in Wikipedia what they are if I haven't already told you. Yeah. Now someone actually said, well gosh, it, it's not just yellow, it is Belgian yellow. And they actually looked up the exact RGB codes for Belgian yellow. And sure, I mean, why not? But if you just made it plain old yellow, uh, the grader will take it. The grader is not going to sit there and figure out whether it's the exact right sh shade of yellow. So the grader is going to look at it and say, are there two flags? Do they you know, reasonably look like the two flags that you were supposed to? Any other questions about this? All right. Let's move on with the lecture. All right, so now I fixed this one. There's, there was no class on the on Friday. <coughs> so <coughs> a, a bit of a pesky thing in Java is this distinction between regular methods or instance methods and so-called static methods. So <coughs> in Java, numbers are not objects. And so you can't invoke methods on numbers. So you, here I have a num uh, number x. And now logically, you would say one should just be able to say x dot square root. And in fact, in some other object-oriented languages, that's perfectly fine. But in Java, it just happens not to be fine. So in, in Java, you have to do it differently. And you've already seen last time how to do it. You have to use the method, which is called mass dot square root. And you feed it the x as, an, as a regular explicit parameter. Um, <coughs> so this is an example of what's called a static method. 
It's not called a static method for any good reason. It just is. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's not like static in, in any normal sense of the word. It's, it's a term that was, was used for historical reasons, and uh, one just has to remember it. Um, and the static methods belong to classes just like regular old methods, but they don't operate on objects. So when you call them, you put to the left of the dot, you put the name of the class to which they belong. So square root is a method of the math class, and, and whenever you want to call it, you say math dot square root. Every method is a method of some class, so you, you always call it either with an object on the left, if it's not a static method, or with a class on the left, if it is a static method. Um, and that's really all uh, that you need, need to know about them. Um, how do you know that math is a class, or at least how can you have a guess? There's a naming convention in Java that says class names start with an uppercase letter, method names and variable names should start with a lowercase letter, and as you've seen last time, constants are an all uppercase. So if you have something that starts with an uppercase letter and otherwise has a bunch of lowercase letters in there, then it's a, uh, very likely to be a class, and so that tells you math is a class and squared is a static method. Um, <coughs> Over here, when you look at system.out, notice that system is a class. And out is defined inside that class. And it actually is, as it turns out, a static variable. Uh, and we'll learn more about static variables in, in chapter 8. Um, do I want to do this? No. Uh, oh, yeah, well, whatever. Just to see if, in, if anyone remembers this. All right.
All right, so let's see it. Um, <coughs> so we have two numbers, x and y. Um, the first answer can't be right because x is a number and not an object, and you can't invoke methods on objects in Java. The same thing here. So what's the difference between 2 and 4? It's whether pow is an instance method or whether it's a static method. Um, well, it's invoked on a class, because math is a class, starts with an uppercase letter, so it must be a static method. And so the right answer is 4. Let's see how that went. OK, so that was not that. So a small number of people chose this one here. And so the key here is that an instance method, that's the methods that you normally see, the ones that operate on an object. So for example, um, what's an instance method? Length on a string, because you say str dot length. And so you have object on the left, method on the right, and that's an instance method. But when you have a class on the left and a method on the right, then it's a static method. Ah. Well, since it's going so well. Oh, yes, I actually do want to do it. This one is, is harder.
on. One more. There we go. All right. So <coughs> let's see. Printl is a static method of the class system dot out. Well, that's a funny class name. Are there classes that have a dot in their name? Can you have a dot in the name of a class? So yes, you can have a dot in the name of a class. But as it turns out, this one is also an uppercase letter, and that's what would happen in this case. You would write them both with an uppercase letter. And so system.out is not a class. It's an object. And I told you before it's an object, and you, may, you might have remembered from that. But uh, so it's, uh, even though it's conceivable to have a class with a weird name like that, it, it is an object. And no one would name it like that. So it's, since this is not a class, one can't be right. Now, can you have a dot in the name of a method, out.printon? Can you have a method that's called out.printon? No. You cannot have a dot in the name of a method. So classes can nest. Um, you can have one class inside another. That's what's happening with ellipse2d.double. But methods, uh, they, they can't. So that can't be a method. So printon is, in fact, an instance method. So that means when you call print on, you have an object on the left and you have parameters to the right. The object to the left is system.out, and that is in fact an object. And then here the call we have is here. And now the difference between three and four is what is the implicit parameter? Is the implicit one the one on the left or the one on the right? It's the one on the left. So this one here is the implicit. And this one is the explicit. <coughs> because when you code up the method, the explicit are the ones that you mentioned. All right, so let's see how that went. OK, that is a cleverly crafted question. Uh, so have a look at this again. I know it, it is confusing. And so you need to understand you know, a static method is one where it doesn't operate on an object on the left. It's just tossed into some class. And so it, it, I realize it's somewhat unintuitive what happens with system.out, which is why I came up with this great question. So one more time, system.out is an object. And it's the object that represents the console. On that object, one can call dot print on. Now it turns out there's other objects on which you can call print on. Later on, we're going to be doing file output, and then on a file you can say print on. And then it shows up in the file, except in, and not on the console. So the method is the same thing. These objects belong to the same class, but they, uh, <coughs> they just are mapped to different destinations. All right, moving on, strings. So we've seen the string class already in ch uh, chapter two. Um, a string is a sequence of characters. And all strings are objects, so it's only numbers that are funny. Strings are uh, perfectly normal objects. We already know this terminology of a string literal. It is a string that is defined literally by telling what characters are inside the special syntax for it. We've already seen the length method. When you have any old string, you can invoke length. So this is an instance method. You see the dot here, and it returns the length of the string. Um, <coughs> there is the notion of an empty string. An empty string is a string that has no characters in it. Now, why would you ever want to have an empty string? Um, sometimes you just want to denote uh, <coughs> that someone, say, has said nothing. Like you might have a response. You know, that might have, might have been a question, say, to a presidential candidate why they haven't returned that, all their tax returns. And the candidate might have said nothing at all. In that case, the empty string would, uh, would denote that. Um, yes? No. Yes, you can put uh, it's, this is a string. 
And you can invoke a dot with a string method on any old string. You don't have to put it in a variable. That's just the way it is. I mean, similarly, when you pass it as a parameter, you don't have to put it in a variable. In the, the, the reason for confusion might be that in C and C++, for technical reasons, th this wouldn't work, particularly in C++. So if you've had C++, um, it turns out that this, it w it's not the, the right kind of string. But in Java, it's perfectly logical and it works fine. So, and you can try that as always in the BlueJ code pad here. <coughs> so if in doubt, try the code pad. Then it says five. But if I say Harry.length without the quotes, then it says it doesn't know what the variable Harry is. It thinks it's a variable. Um, let's try it with the empty string. And it says the empty string has length zero, which is kind of what you would expect. All right. Concatenation, if you have more than one string, you can put them together. So if I have Two strings, they get together like that. Um, as you notice, there's no space in between. So that's maybe not so pretty. Um, and we can easily fix that by adding a space. And now there's a space. So whatever you put in those strings gets just smashed together to make one long string. And the technical term for smashing those strings together is called concatenation, which you must admit sounds so much better than smashing the strings together. All right, <coughs> it's just an operator. It, just, it takes two strings and sticks them one after the other. Or you, know, you can use it as often as you like. If you look over here, I've used it twice in a row. I've first concat concatenated these and then stuck this one at the end. So it's, in fact, very common to do that. Um, now, what's even nicer is um, they don't both have to be strings. If one of them is a string and the other one isn't a string, then the second one is turned into a string and the entire thing gets put together. So if I say agent plus seven, notice that seven is a number, then I get the string agent seven. Now you might say, who cares? This is, oops, I forgot the semicolon, let me add that. Um, this is something that happens all the time when you produce output. Because when you produce output, you usually have some mixture of text and numbers. And so the easiest way of producing that combined output is to use the operator plus here. Now, you didn't strictly have to do it, right? You could have said system.out.print expected and then system.out print on seven, ah. and that would have also glued them together, except here I forgot to turn on that option to, to leave the old st stuff in place. That would have also glued them together, but it's not as, uh, I mean, it's, it's more writing, right? So, so anytime that you do output, you're gonna be using this, this gluing thing. N notice that at least one of the two has to be a string, of course. So if you say seven plus seven, then that's good old 14. But watch this. Now I've taken the empty string, added a seven and another seven, and the, this one here is now already the string containing seven, and then I added another seven as a string concatenation afterwards, and that glues it together. So it's maybe a little bit unfortunate that they use the exact same symbol, the plus symbol, for gluing strings together and for adding numbers. There's plenty of other symbols to go around, but that's what they've just chosen to do. All right, so here you have the concatenation and print statements that I've just talked about. You know, instead of laboriously first writing the string and then the number, you can just glue the string and the number together over here, and then you print the whole thing. So this is uh, very common uh, what people do. 
Now, <coughs> there's a difference between a string containing 7 and the number 7 itself. So for example, if I take the string containing 7 and add to that another 7, then I get a string, whereas 7 plus 7 is a number. So they're different. And other operations are not possible at all. If I take a string and multiply it, say, by 2, I don't get a string containing, well, I don't even want to speculate what I should be getting. Instead, I get an error. So, <coughs> well, fine, I'll do that, and then I'll get an even worse error. Well, a variable has a type. So, when you declare a variable, you say what type you declare it as, and then it can hold the uh, one or the other. So now if I were to put into num equals um, the string three, that would be an error. Or if I would put into stir the number three, that would also be an error. They just live in different universes. Numbers are numbers, and strings are strings. And I guess the only way for them to meet is through the concatenation operator. What? I could say string equals string plus three, and then that would concatenate. It, at that point, the plus would mean concatenation. But I couldn't say string equals string times 3. That would be an error because you can't multiply strings. So as it happens, plus works for both numbers and strings, even though it means different things. All the other operators do not work on strings. So they really are different animals. And once in a while, it happens that you have one and you wished for the other. It particularly happens when you read input. Sometimes you, you <clears throat> get it, some digits out of some input string, and then you want to convert just those digits for a number, and then you use this uh, one of these functions here. You have a question? Uh, could you also subtract from the string? No. So um, if you ask, for example, Harry minus h, you know, it would make intuitive sense that this maybe means to remove the h from Harry, but it, it doesn't work in Java. So the only uh, conflicting operation at all is plus, which works on both. And like I said, with entirely different meanings. So um, if you want to convert a string containing a number to a number, then you use this parse int or parse double function. So let's say I have a string um, a, and that contains the number 1, 2, 3. It's not, the, it's not a number. I can't multiply it by 2. Um, but if I want to get a number out of it, then I would say int n equals integer dot parse int of a. And now n is a number. You can see a 1, 2, 3 as an integer. And now I can say n times 2, and that'll work just fine. So, ever, so often that does happen. Conversely, if you have a number, and now you want to make it into a string, that actually is, is a bit simpler. So let's say I have a number 1729. And now I want to turn that into a string. You can simply add the empty string, and that concatenates it with the empty string. And now you get the digits in a string. Now why might you want this? Um, when you have a string like this, you can reverse it easily. So let me do that um, string digits equals quote plus 1729. Then I could say digits reverse. Is it reversed? All right, I'll, I'll just call length. I don't know if there's. OK, now it tells me there's four digits. So if someone asks you to write a program that reads a number and then tells you how many digits there are, this is a simple way of doing it. Convert it to a string and compute its length. So ever so often, these conversions are handy. Substrings. Substrings are important. So oftentimes, it happens that you have a string, and you want to extract a piece of it. So for example, with uh, the agent 007, you might want to just get that number, the 007, and then convert it to an integer. Or here I have this example where you have the string hello world. 
and you want to extract out of it the hello and then the world. So <coughs> there's a method to extract substrings called substring. It doesn't ruin the original string. It simply copies out the substring at the positions that you specify. The way you specify the positions is a bit odd. You specify the starting position. And the starting position, for historical reasons, starts at 0. So um, it's, it's common in programming languages to start counting at 0. And so a computer scientist might count the people in the first row as 0, 1, 2, 3, and then conclude that there were four people sitting there. So <clears throat> and th this follows the same convention. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of the convention, but um, it's not for us to argue. That's what we have to do. And the next index here, the 5, is the first position that we don't want to include. So uh, <clears throat> let's see how this works here with, with uh, this particular example. We, we start at 0. We then include 1, 2, 3, 4. And the 5 is the first one that we don't want, so that extracts the word hello. Let's extract the word world the same way. We want to start at position 7. We don't want position 12. That's the exclamation mark. So we call from 7 to 12. Yes? If we wanted to extract the exclamation point as well, would we use 13? Absolutely. So if you wanted the exclamation mark, then you would say the first position that you don't want is 13 which doesn't actually exist anymore. You surely don't want it. And you would put a 13. So what happens if you extract starting at 13? Well, let's give it a try. So here's Hello World. And so if I extract, first of all, the one that we've seen from 7 to 12, that's World from 7 to 13. That's world with the exclamation mark. And now let's say I want to see what, what's after the abyss, what's from 13 to 14, or even just from 13 to 13. Ah, from 13 to 13 is the empty string, because I'm saying, give me everything starting at 13, but don't actually take the 13. I don't want it. But if you go one further, then you get a java.lang.string index out of bounds exception. So a java.lang.string index out of bounds exception means that you have done something very bad in plain English. What you've done is you have used a string index or a string position that was beyond the valid positions. And when you do that, your program dies with that message. So the best way to go to the end would just be use the greeting.length? Yes, so if you needed to know how far you can go, you use greeting.length. And that gets you the last, uh, that gets you the first index that's no longer a part of the string, really, because the length of this particular string, let's try this, is 13. Yes. And so this will happen to you a lot in, uh, in the next few weeks as you take strings apart. It's a very, very common error to accidentally go past the end, and then you'll get that, that exception. All right, so let's practice this real quick. Um, A very realistic example.
Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Okay, I've often wondered what happens in a situation like this. Um, so let's see, so S is agent. So and when we now look at this line here, we're concatenating agent, double O, and S dot length. What's S dot length? Five, right? So we get this string here. Now we're taking a substring and that's the one that goes from 0 to 5. So at this point, you have to write the little numbers under it because otherwise it's just too hard. So we're taking the substring that goes from 0 to 5. That's agent because we're not taking the 5. We're now taking the substring that goes from 6 to... to so length dot one is six, yes. Okay, from six to six. And so the correct answer is it's agent zero, which is none of the above. Um, so now what should I check? Apparently 86 people had no trouble checking something. Uh, let's see what they did check. Oh, it does say agent six here. Oh. Oh, oh no. Okay, never mind. So it's right. Oh, it's just agent zero. Okay. Okay, so, so it's agent zero, not agent six. All right. So, um, yeah, that's too bad. So I'll, I should fix that clicker question. <laughs> so let's see if people. Yeah. From six to six? Oh, that sounds even better. Okay, let's let's do this again. So agent We had zero zero six, right? And then let's put the little numbers before us. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, zero zero five. Zero zero five, because the length was was five before. Yeah, right. Well, it does, but I haven't changed S yet. See, it first computes the left-hand side. And after it's done computing the left-hand side, then it makes the assignment. Sorry, the right-hand side. What am I talking about? It first computes the right-hand side. Then it moves it into S. So it has not yet moved it into S. So right now, when it evaluates S dot length, it's still 5. <laughs> Even if I put in parentheses. The, um, so the parentheses have no effect on the assignment. So if I were to put like this thing in parentheses or this thing in parentheses, 
It doesn't change the fact that the assignment happens after the right-hand side has been computed. The parentheses only say, do you compute the first plus or the second plus first? But it doesn't make a difference in which order you do. So, so back to the uh, remark from here. So s dot length at this point was no, sorry, was h. So s dot length minus one is seven. And so I extract starting at six, and not taking the seven. So I do take a zero out of here. And so the answer really is h and and then a zero. So let's actually see if we can't cheat and put this into here. And there it is. Okay. So as a as a chip, uh, I mean, you could perfectly well have Blue Jay open like during the exam, for example. I would never ask an exam question like this, right? Because you could just have Blue Jay open and paste it right in. Um, but at least that way you can see whether you're on the right track. All right, I'll have to fix that. Okay, why do I have these here? Um, <coughs> I should. I, I do want to say a couple of words about the fact that um, in now, <coughs> nowadays, certainly in Java and most other programming languages, there's plenty more letters than uh, what's on your uh, American keyboard. So here's, for example, an, a German keyboard. And when you look over here, you notice that here you have the umlauts, here you have the double S. And so people in, in other countries you know, have all sorts of keyboards with all sorts of different characters. And they're all perfectly valid characters, and they can be a part of a string. In fact, now here is the, an alphabet that looks stranger to, to many of us. Um, and any of those characters could also be put in a string. It's just a little difficult to find the codes for all of those. Um, and here you have some uh, Chinese letters. They, can, they too can be a part of a string. So how would I put something like this in? Uh, it helps if you know the Unicode code for something. So um, you, can, uh, you write the Unicode by writing a backslash U and then the letter. And so as it happens, the trademark symbol as we all know, has Unicode 2122, trivia fact of the day. And so here's how you can include it. Now, if you wanted to know the Unicode of some other letter, let's say the Greek letter pi, then you'd, uh, you ask Google. And here, Wikipedia knows the answer to everything. And it'll tell us what the Unicode is. Here. So Greek small letter pi is Unicode. Here it has the symbol U plus 03C0. But the way you do it in Java, you say backslash is U and then 03C0. And that's now a string containing the letter pi. You can have as many as you want. So if you want to trademark the letter pi, um, you just string one after the other. And here's your trademark pi. All right. Um, and there's uh, all sorts of symbols. You know, it's kind of useful to know what the Unicode for a smiley face is. And Wikipedia, ever helpful, will tell us. Um, 26.3a, well, that sounds like something we should actually remember. And so here you have a smiley face character that you can now include into your output as needed. All right. OK, finally, reading input. <coughs> um, so far, we have not had any program that, com that communicated with the user, really. The program ran, produced some output, and that was the end of it. But real programs, of course, do uh, take input from the user. And now we're finally learning how to do that. Um, so that'll be a big thing going forward, that we can write programs that, that are interactive, that, that take any amount of input. Um, <coughs> it's, 
it used to be kind of difficult to do in the olden days of Java. So system, there's a system.in that works just like system.out, but uh, system.in um, required a lot of work to do input with, and eventually they fixed this up and they produced this class called a scanner. So you make a scanner by calling the constructor. So scanner is a class. It has a constructor, new scanner. And then you have to say, you want to have a scanner that reads its input from system.in, from the keyboard. You have to give that object a name. I have no particular inventiveness here, and so I just always call it in. So in is the scanner, system.in is the thing that, that symbolizes the keyboard that you can't use directly. And now you can say uh, system.outprint, enter quantity, and then you call in.nextint. So the next int method reads the next integer from the, the input. Um, there's two other methods, next double, no, three other methods. Next double, next line, and next. Next double does what you think it does. It reads a floating point number. Next line reads an entire line of text as a, as a string. Um, I don't think we're going to be using that for a while. And next reads a word until the next white space. Let me write a quick program that practices these so you can see it with your own eyes. Um, I have to, to do this by hand because there's no really convenient way of doing this uh, in, in the code pad. All right, so here I'm um, reading in <coughs> an integer, and then I'll print out that integer plus one. So let's see how that works. So it asks, how old are you? And it says, next year, you'll be one year older. Uh, that's the way it is. Um, so, so I've put in it, in <coughs> I've called next int here. Now, let's just try a couple of variations of running this. And if I put in something that's not an integer, then I get an input mismatch exception and the program dies. For right now, for I think for the entire semester actually, we're going to assume that this never happens. So you can assume that NetBrad and the grader won't ever do this to you. At the very end of the semester, we'll, we'll have situations maybe where, where we start taking those things into account. For right now, don't worry about it. Um, let's read in a, a string instead. And so then, I'd have to read it as a string. And it's called next, not next string. And then we'll just say hello. Plus name plus. All right, so.
So it doesn't matter what I put in, you know, it reads it in. Um, except there's a catch to it, and that's why I'm giving this demo here. What happened? Yeah, it only reads the, a, a word at a time. And so if you wanted to read the whole thing, you would have to call the, the next line method, and then that, that would work. Or, as we'll see somewhere later during the course, there is, there's a way of finding out whether there are more words to come. But right now, we don't yet know how to do that. OK, um, I don't want to do any of this. I don't want to do any of this. No. All right. Uh, the last thing that I do want to do is remind you that there is a practice exam. So there's no class on Monday. And so if you don't know what to do with all that free time, that's where this practice exam comes in handy. Um, so it's exactly like one of the exams that you're going to be taking, uh, like the exam you're going to be taking on Wednesday, except different questions, of course. So go ahead, work through that practice exam. Any questions about the practice exam, put them on Piazza. All right, that's all. So good luck on the exam on Wednesday, and we'll continue the Monday afternoon.